that finishes this morning, uh, the letter to the Ephesians, and we want to just go directly into the letter to the Philippians. I want to give you a little bit of background, and then we'll just look at verses 1 and 2. We're going to see that the opening of the letter to the Philippians very much like the closing of the letter to the Ephesians. Uh, it's another wish for grace and peace to his, uh, to his audience. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, just some background on this letter. It's written to the church at Philippi, and that city was named after Philip II of Macedon. He actually was the father of Alexander the Great. This city was located, and you can see it on the map here. I'm going to trace out Paul's journey. Let's see, I'm not getting it. We're just right up here in this upper left-hand corner, Philippi. I'll, pray, I'll trace out his journey in just a bit. But the city itself was located 11 miles inland from the Aegean Sea, which was, and it was on the Ignatian Way, which is a very uh, large thoroughfare or road of the Roman Empire. The city was strategic militarily as a defense against northern invasion because of the way it was positioned in a place where the Balkan Mountains descended into the pass through which this major ro roadway went. So it's always good in a city, if you want to have a militarily strong city, to be high up. And that's the way that the Philippi was positioned. It was so similar in its character to the capital of the empire that it was known as a little Rome. Paul, of course, uh, is the one that founded this church. He was accompanied by Silas and Luke. He founded the church on his second missionary journey. And let's trace out that now. If we start at Antioch. That's where Paul started his missionary journeys. That's the church from which he was sent out. On his second missionary journey, the first thing he did was to go through those same cities that he had gone through in his first journey and strengthen the believers that were in those cities. So Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Pisidian Antioch. Remember, too, on his second missionary journey, he picked up Timothy in Lystra, and he accompanied, on, accompanied him on that journey. They continue on. Uh, they're forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go up into the northern part of Asia, and they end up in the city of Troas. And it's at Troas that Paul receives this vision of a man in Macedonia. Macedonia is the, the name of the region of the Roman Empire that Philippi was in. And this man was saying to Paul in this dream, come over and help us. So that's what they do. They cross uh, the northern portion of the Aegean Sea, across the island of Samothrace and into the port city of Neapolis, and from there they moved down to Philippi. Now, we have a rather full account of the establishment of the church there in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. I want to encourage you to go ahead and turn your Bibles there. We're going to read through, and I'm just going to make a few comments as we read, Acts 16, verses 11 through 40. <clears throat> Acts 16, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia. So it's called a district here. The, the Roman Empire was divided up into these districts, and the city of Philippi was a leading one in that, in that district. A Roman colony. And we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. That's a little bit unusual. Where was the place that Paul normally went whenever he first entered a city? Synagogue. Went to a synagogue. It made sense to go there. Those people would have the background of the Old Testament scriptures. He was proclaiming Christ as the Messiah that was promised by the Old Testament scriptures. He was also proclaiming the gospel as Jew and Gentile in one body. Well, evidently, Philippi, Philippi, the city, did not have a large enough Jewish population to have a synagogue. So instead, they had this place of prayer by the riverside, and that's where they went. We think that, uh, based on that, we think that the, uh, the church makeup in Philippians is largely Gentile. A certain woman named Lydia 
from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. So we have here the first converts of the Philippian church, Lydia and her household. She prevailed upon us, and it happened as if we were going to the place of prayer. So remember, they're there for several weeks. They're making return trips back to this place of prayer. A certain slave girl, having a spirit of divination, met us, who is bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Now, this is a little different, too, as far as the establishment of church goes. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. We think, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, that's true. Uh, Paul didn't see it that way. What she was saying was true, but they didn't need that kind of help. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, the spirit that was within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He came out at that very moment. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, and again, they were able to, she was able to tell fortunes based on this spirit that was within her, a demon in reality. When they realized that uh, their their prophet was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. And the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. Now that wasn't so unusual, right? Paul very often would go into the synagogues, he would proclaim Christ, some would believe, but it would immediately stir up opposition by the Jews. Now this is a little different in Philippi. I think these are Romans that are opposing Paul and not Jews. We've already talked about the fact that there were not as many Jews in this city. But that's just one of the sources of really three main sources of persecution that believers faced early on. They faced persecution from the Jews who would not accept Christ as the Messiah and would not accept Jew and Gentile in one body. They faced persecution from their fellow citizens because once you embraced Christ, you couldn't participate in all the immorality that was associated with pagan religions. And it was very much tied together. Even your guild, the place where you worked, had patron gods associated with it, and you would no longer participate in those things. So you would immediately get persecution from your fellow Roman citizens. And then the third source of persecution was the Roman government itself, the authorities. Paul and his co-workers faced opposition from all of these. When they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison. So they're making sure that they are securely imprisoned. They're in the inner prison, and they're fastened, they fasten their feet in the stocks. Now you can see how God is setting all of this up, because he's going to do something uh, very unusual here, and it's only going to uh, help the church in the sense of establishing Paul as a spokesman for God. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors, all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Now, certainly that's not something that normally happened in the establishment of the church, but this was God's way of establishing this church in Philippi. When the jailer had been roused out of sleep and had seen the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. They were going to kill him if his prisoners got away, and he was just going to preempt that and kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Paul immediately becomes in control of the situation. We see this in a number of different places over the course of his ministry. Even when he's 
under the authority of the Romans, and I'm thinking about the shipwreck in particular, God raises him up, really, in authority and tells them what to do. And when they follow it, uh, you know, there's a good outcome. And when they don't follow it, there's not so good. In this case, uh, he's telling the, the prison guard what to do. He called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So you, again, you can see how all these supernatural events have opened the heart of the jailer. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord together with him, with all those who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized in all his household. So you see the very same thing that happened with Lydia. First, there was somebody within the household, actually the leader, who came to know the Lord. He brought, or he or she brought Paul and his co-workers into their household. The whole house heard the word of the Lord, and they all became believers. He brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Notice the response in both cases is hospitality towards Paul both by Lydia and by the Philippian jailer. Now when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported the, these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Now therefore, come out and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They've beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. Again, you can see he's in charge at this point, and Paul never flinched from using his own Roman citizenship. He was a Jew, but he was also a Roman. He used that to his advantage when the occasion called for it, and this was one of them. <coughs> the policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. They were afraid because Romans prided themselves on giving due process. A lot of our own legal system comes from the Romans. And in this case, they'd not done that. They had beaten these men uh, without any kind of trial and without any kind of formal charges. And Paul's, in a sense, Paul's making them pay for that. They came and appealed to them, and when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. And they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, Again, she lives in Philippi. She's probably well known there as a seller of these purple fabrics, an inf influential woman in the city. They come into the house. When they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. That was the establishment of the church in Philippi. It's going to grow from here, but you can see it has a very strong start as a church. Paul visit this church twice on his third missionary journey, and this was Paul's habit. He would go to these cities. He would establish new churches, and then he would always try to find a way to get back to those same churches and strengthen them through the word of God. This church in Philippi was one that was very near and dear to him. It was included among those that he held up as an example to the Corinthians because of their generosity. This was something else that Paul did regularly. If there was one church that was giving generously and another one that was kind of struggling with their collection, he would point to the good church as an example and say, look how these guys are doing it. You should do the same. In fact, this church at Philippi ministered to Paul financially on several occasions, as we'll see when we get to Philippians chapter 4. Paul is writing this letter to them about 10 years after the church was founded. Now, we've already talked about the fact that Philippians is part of a group that are known as a group of four letters that are known as the prison epistles or captivity epistles. And that's because they were written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon were probably written in the earlier part of that imprisonment, and Philippi came last. We talked about this a little already, but let's look at it again. Paul's in Rome. He writes this letter to the Ephesians, the Colossians, and to Philemon. Remember, Philemon is the master of Onesimus, 
who was a runaway slave, who had ended up in Rome. He'd come to know the Lord through Paul's ministry, even as a prisoner there. And Paul is writing a letter back to his master, Philemon, to accept Onesimus back, not only as a slave, but also as a brother. So Tychicus and, and Onesimus are going to be the ones that deliver this letter to Ephesus. And then that letter is going to be circulated around to the churches, other churches in the area. These would include at least some of the seven churches of the book of Revelation, as well as others in the area of Ephesus. We don't know for sure if Tychicus himself might have made that journey and circulated the letter, or somebody else. But we, we very much believe that Ephesians would have been read by all the churches in that area. And then Tychicus and Onesimus would have gone on to the city of Colossae, Colossae here, and delivered the letter to the Colossians. Philemon was a member of that church. So Onesimus is coming back to Colossae as uh, his servant, his slave, and now also as a brother in Christ. During the last part of Paul's imprisonment, he would have written a letter to the Philippians, and that was delivered by a guy named Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was from the city of Philippi. He had come, he'd heard about Paul being imprisoned at Rome. And he had come there to minister to him. And while he was there, he'd gotten very sick, even sick close to the point of death. And the people in Philippi had heard about that. So the occasion for this letter is uh, Epaphroditus being returned back to the city of Philippi. And Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 2. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my needs. So again, the Philippians sent Epaphroditus to minister to Paul. He's now sending him back. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I've sent him all the more eagerly in order that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Again, Paul is going to send Epaphroditus not only to give them this letter of encouragement, but also he can give uh, an update on Paul and his cir circumstances to the Philippian believers. Okay, so let's kind of sum up what we've talked about in, uh, just in this introduction to the letter to the Philippians. It's obviously written by the Apostle Paul who founded the church there. Timothy is with him as he writes this letter. The date is about 62 AD. It's near the end of Paul's Roman imprisonment. As we read through Philippians, we're going to see that he's optimistic about being released. And we believe that he was released uh, after this first imprisonment. It's written about 10 years after the church at Philippi was initially founded. That church was established on Paul's second missionary journey. We believe it was predominantly Gentile because uh, there, wasn't, there weren't even enough Jews to constitute a synagogue there. And the occasion for the letter was Epaphroditus' return trip to write the Philippians a letter of friendship and encouragement. And that goes to the character of the letter. It's a personal letter of joyful encouragement and gratitude from the Apostle Paul to a church who had been very faithful to support him. Now, the predominant theme in the letter to the Philippians is joy. The term rejoice, or some form of it, occurs 16 times in that letter. And that's magnified by the fact, one, Paul's in prison as he writes this letter. He's been in prison now for four years between Caesarea and Rome, Caesarea and Rome. And yet he's still rejoicing in the Lord. Not only is he in prison, but when he's in prison, he hears that there are some who are preaching Christ <coughs> so as to cause him distress in his imprisonment. And yet he doesn't let that distress him. He's glad that the gospel is being made known, even by those who oppose him personally. Another major theme of Ephesians, I'm sorry, of Philippians is unity, being of the same mind with one another. And we'll see that as we work through the letter as well. So to sum up the purposes for which Philippians is written, to provide information to the Philippian believers on Paul's circumstances and the ongoing advance of the gospel through those circumstances, uh, 
to express Paul's affection for those believers who have been very faithful partners with him in the gospel, to warn the Philippians against the Judaizers. We didn't see this in Ephesians so much, this false teaching that is working against the church and trying to infiltrate the church. It's something that started very early in the life of the church. And Paul's having to oppose it here in this letter. He's also writing to warn those who are leading licentious lives. And then finally, to exhort the Philippians to live lives of unity, humility, joy, and thanksgiving. Those are four words that we could use to sum up the major, sum up the major themes of Philippians as well. I have an outline of Philippians that I want to make sure you get. I'll, I'll put those on a chair back here on the back row, and you can just pick that up at your convenience. It's an outline of the whole book on one page, and it'll just help you as we work through this letter again, together. All right, so with that as background, let's just look at these first two verses briefly. Again, this is a, a salutation, and a lot of it's very similar to what we've said already uh, at both the beginning and the end of Ephesians. Philippians 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one thing that's a little bit unusual about this letter is the only one that singles out the leadership of the church in addition to all the other believers there. It may be that there was a need for humility on their part because that's a major theme of one of the letters, uh, of the letter. Such humility and the harmony that goes along with humility are our major themes. And Paul will point to Christ as the ultimate example of humility in the very well-known passage that we'll look at in Philippians 2. It's known as the kenosis or the self-emptying of Christ, the fact that he was willing to empty the glory he had with the Father and come to earth as a man. He points to that as the ultimate example of humility, and, and he exhorts the Philippians to, to follow that example. Just as Paul did with the Ephesians, and in virtually every other letter that he writes, Paul expresses his wish of grace and peace to those to whom he writes. Grace, again, is God's ongoing unmerited favor that they've already experienced the salvation. And peace is that tranquility and well-being of life that results first from being at peace with God. You can't have the peace that Paul is wishing for you here unless you first have uh, removal of the hostility between God and yourself through the gospel. Well, that sets us up for next week. We'll look at Paul's prayer for these believers that were so precious to him in verses 3 through 11. Let me have a word of prayer before um, Matt and Susanna come to sing for us, lead us in singing. Father, we thank you for both of these letters. We thank you for just the things that you've taught us through the letter to the Ephesians. And I pray that those would stay with us uh, from this point forward and we would just continue to uh, walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling in light of all that you've done for us in Christ. And just to be mindful of the fact that we are in a spiritual warfare that not only does Satan tempt us and, and seek to oppose us, but also our own flesh. We still have to do battle with it. And we just pray that as we're aware of that battle, we would appropriate the armor of God to live lives that are faithful to you. And then now, as we consider the letter to the Philippians and the great joy we see in the Apostle Paul's life, despite the fact that he'd been in prison and restricted in his freedom for some four years now, he still had joy in the Lord. He still saw the progress of the gospel. And he was still actually very uh, optimistic about his release. Lord, I just pray as we work through this letter together over the next several weeks that you would give us that same kind of joy regardless of our circumstances and that you would make us the same kind of faithful partners in the gospel that both Paul and the Philippian believers were. Thank you for the time we've had together this morning and, and we look forward to in the second hour when Matt's teaching to us on Ezra and Nehemiah. Father, we pray that you would help us understand that part of your word better and the way that fits into your total plan. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.